So now you know how to convert a formula to its Prinx form. Though Prinx form is not unique, but all the quantifiers will be in the beginning, and then there will be another formula without any quantifiers. And in order to do that, we first start to rectify the formula. That is not necessary really, but it helps. If you have done it, then up to equivalence you can go for the next step easily. Well, so our first concern was for the Prinx form. Our main objective was how to get rid of the quantifiers, get only the matrix, right? But as it is, we cannot just omit the quantifiers because if you omit, you cannot reconstruct it back up to equivalence or up to satisfiability, or in some sense. So you have to fix some sense and then try to see how to drop the quantifiers so that that sense is preserved. Up to this, we are doing everything for equivalence. Now onwards, we have to sacrifice on that. Up to equivalence, if you proceed, you cannot drop the quantifiers as such. So there are two approaches here. We may take preserving satisfiability or preserving validity. Right? We will see both the approaches. Then let us stick to one because we see that they are dual to each other. So let's consider say satisfiability. So suppose we have a formula in Prinx form. So it would look something like q1 some x1 q2 x2 some qn xn and then some matrix of the formula which is quantifier free okay now there can be some free variables in x which have never been quantified here right if your original formula is having those free variables so by rectification or by renaming those free variables still remain as free variables fine so we want to preserve satisfiability. Then our earlier theorem really helps here. We can really convert to a sentence because we know that a formula is satisfiable if and only if its existential closure is satisfiable, right? Suppose we have free variables y1 to yn in X, fine. So then we can take there is y1, there is y2, and there is ym. Then q1 x1. Q2 X2, Qn Xn X. So we say that this formula is satisfiable if and only if its universal closure is also satisfiable. Fine. Now we have reached one sentence which is satisfiable or not. Fine. Our aim is to get rid of the prefix from this sentence somehow. Still. Preserving satisfiability. Fine. So maybe one simple form of the formula might help. So let's take. Say it is in the form. There is x for each y and x, which has two variables x and y. X depends on only x and y. So let's write the other way instead of the square bracket. That might go for substitution. Hmm. So x x comma y means there are only two free variables here it is a sentence now suppose you want to say that il is a state which is a state model of this fine so in that state how you will translate this sentence you don't need the state now it's enough to have one interpretation only right because it is a sentence so let us say i satisfies this i is a an interpretation whose domain is d and the mapping is say phi. So this phi should give us the meanings of predicates occurring in x x y. Somehow it will relate to the relations or if there are function symbols it will relate to functions over the domain d keeping rt right that is what it is then it will be a sentence this sentence will be translated like there is some element in the domain d such that whatever element you choose from the same d the corresponding substitutions when you think of relations instead of x let us say x prime where x will be written as d y will be written as say d prime that will be satisfied that will be true that is what it says right. So now we see that that particular element d does not depend upon any other variables right there exists one d such that then the other sentence becomes true on its own right only thing is d has to be replaced here that is its meaning 
when you come to the interpretation. Okay. But if you consider another sentence, say I satisfies for each y there is x, 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 y, there is a difference. Fine. It will say that if you have chosen that d prime here, an element, then the corresponding d might vary depending on this d prime in some particular way. So, that the formula x x y or x d d prime becomes true, right. The same d may not work, that is the intuition. So, if that is so, that means if there is a universal quantifier occurring prior to some existential quantifier, then the existential quantifier uses the variable, that variable might depend on the variables used by the universal quantifiers. This is what the intuition says. Right. So, if this depends or this does not depend, these two cases have to be clearly demarcated. Right. So, when this does not depend, for example, there is x for each y, we might say that instead of x, I replace a new constant c. So, this new constant in the sense of new, when you say new, it means it should not occur in this formula, that is all we need. Is that right? So, suppose we consider for each for the first one for each y x c y. Now, I have not in, has not interpreted this c till now, it is a new constant, it has not occurred at all, right. So, now when you say that this is also satisfiable, how do you determine? This I cannot determine it, right, because there is no interpretation of c till now. So, you may have to extend this i. So, that means, we will take i equal to same domain d, but another phi prime, where phi prime is an extension, extension of phi, right, which takes care of c now. Is that okay? But now, any extension will not satisfy, we want such extension which will satisfy the formula, right. So, that means, earlier we have seen one element d under i was satisfying the corresponding sentence. Now, then in this case, we should put phi prime of that c to be equal to the same element d, is that right. So, that means, under the interpretation i, if taking this x to d satisfies the corresponding formula, we put that phi prime c equal to d, this is the extension we take all other values of phi will remain as it is in phi prime also. Is that right? Then if this is satisfiable, this will also be satisfiable under this domain, new extended interpretation, right, call it say i prime. Okay. So, this is what happens when you go for the next step. In general, this is going to be happening, but then at one step we could prove it one existential quantifier. If there are many proof will be by induction. Is that okay? This will be the crucial step in the induction process up to n you have then n plus 1 existential quantifiers for the next one you apply like this. Is that clear? Now, what about converse? When you go for the converse, you do not have the extension business, right. So, that means the same interpretation should satisfy. Fine. Then how will it? C was new, so that was not new. So suppose I have one interpretation i prime, right? Which has phi for some predicates, some way it is assigned, and phi prime of C equal to some element d. I don't know what d. This d was fixed because of this, some d. Now it is satisfied for each y x c y. Then, in the same interpretation, we just take the same d to work here, right. There exists one of them should satisfy which one that d, take that d. So, that means the same interpretation i prime will also satisfy the earlier formula there exists x for each y x x y. Is it clear? So, it becomes if and only if statement really. So, that means when you delete this there is x replacing all x by a new constant c, whatever formula you get that becomes satisfiable if and only if the original formula is satisfiable. Okay. Is it clear? Now, let us consider the second case, what happens here? 
for each y there is x x x y. So, this says the x which we will get from the domain corresponding to that the element we get from the domain might be depending on the values of y. Yes, some doubt? So, question is how is it different from the existential specification? In existential specification, what you do? Suppose there exists x, p x, and from this you want to have some uh, entanglement, right? Of another formula, say y. Okay. So what you do is you start with p c, then show that y e is entailed, y is not having that constant c. Now then you claim there is x p x entails this y. Right? All that we know there is p c doesn't follow from there is x p x. Right? Here also we are not telling that this formula follows from there is x for each y this. It doesn't follow. All that we say, if this is satisfiable, then this is also satisfiable. There is another interpretation. If it follows from, then the same interpretation should satisfy. Right? Yes. But that we are not concerned at the time of existential specification. Right? All that we are concerned is from there is x from P C, if some formula follows without the occurrence of C then the same formula follows from there is x p x that is what basically existential specification is right. But here we want to preserve satisfiability right new constant appears in both the cases that is the commonality. Okay. Now, let us take the second case. So, suppose for each y there is x x x y is satisfied. So, that means in that interpretation whatever way we have interpreted y say some element d then there is Corresponding to that element for x, which will satisfy, which will make the formula true. Okay. Now, if I vary this element y, say y is going to d1. Now, the corresponding x may vary, may be constant, I do not know, right. But somehow the dependence is there. Now, you have to bring in this dependence, that is the main difference. Okay. So, what we do here is we consider another sentence for each y x say f of x y f of y and y. So, look at this form and this form x is replaced by f of y and we want to show that dependence. So, this f is a new function symbol it is not occurring in x earlier that is the main thing we have to take care when you say new constant here similarly you say new function symbol here. Right. So, f is a new function symbol. Now, that is the catch if it is a new function symbol they can re reinterpret it in fact you have to interpret it fresh it was never interpreted earlier. Right. So, suppose i satisfies for each y there is x x x y. Now, we go for i prime same way where this phi prime of f we have to define now. Is that clear? So, we will define in what way? Phi prime of f of y will be equal to that element d for the corresponding element y here, whatever y element you take it will be that element corresponding to which this formula will become true. right? So, that this new i prime will become a model of this. Is it clear? Now, conversely, if this is already interpreted to be true, okay, so f of y has been interpreted to some d, take that d corresponding to this y. So, the same interpretation always satisfies for each y there is x, 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 y. Just the same as scenario is same as for the earlier, right. So, this suggests that we have to find out when there is there exists is occurring, before that, what are the quantifiers occurring? Right. So, that all those variables used by those quantifiers can be the argument of a new function when you substitute that existentially used variable. Right. But there is another thing when you say that it depends or it might depend 
we have seen some cases where even if it occurs prior to it, it does not depend on that, right. It is because there may not be any atomic formula where both the things are occurring, right. We had one example of this form for each x, we took for each y, okay. For each y, there is x, suppose it is in the form p x implies q y. Right. So, here when you translate it will be looking like for each element in the domain D some elements are there corresponding to that element say D prime such that if D belongs to P prime then D prime belongs to Q prime that is how it will be right. But now you see P can be true or false any way we like Q can be true or false any way we like for the D and D primes. So, it does not matter whether d prime really depends on d or not. It should be true that is all it should be true. So, the thing is by making p d true or false we are not going to change the truth or falsity of q d prime. Yes. Okay. So, all that we need is q d prime has to be true. Okay. It is for each y there is x. So, if there is at least one d prime for which q becomes true that we interpret here that d prime we take here it really does not depend on x is it clear. So, even though for each y there is x is there it will be equivalent to there is x for each y this what I asked you to prove earlier right intuition behind is this once p d becomes true it does not matter what d prime we choose for this d all that matters is q d prime should be true right. So, even if there is something which makes it true it is enough right conversely also the same way if this becomes false it does not matter whatever p d or p d prime is automatically the implication becomes true. Right. That is for the implication, it can be other connectives also, it does not matter. Still, the intuition says that whatever be this elements d or d prime, you substitute in q or q prime, it is a proposition, right. So, this proposition, truth of this proposition will not matter on dependence of d prime on d, right. That is what we want, dependence of d prime on d, that does not because there is no relation which involves both d and d prime. So, p d can be chosen separately, p d prime can be chosen separately to make the whole proposition true, right. No relation which will connect both d and d prime together, there is no restriction on d and d prime in that sense. But had it been say p x y, then you have p d d prime. So, d prime has to be taken in such a way that given a d, p d d prime should be true is this clear. So, the same thing we can extend to this place we have to really check even if there is one there is x uh, and some quantifier for each y is before it we must check whether there is a predicate involving both x and y if not it does not depend for the function for this one function anyway is there whether it is a new constant or a function symbol they are all functions thing is whether you want to write f of y or a not f of y or just a constant ok. That does not matter that does not matter right. So, once f of x y exists it will be occurring in some predicate huh? do you see suppose I have for each y there is x p f of x y implies q y right. So, there is a predicate here where f of x y is there or even you write f x comma y y right. So, once this happens we will say that both x and y occur in the predicate right not independently as x y they are occurring in the with the same predicate both the symbols are occurring 
that is why there is a dependence, possible dependence, that is what it says, right. But if it does not occur, we know it does not depend, fine. So, you have to take care of this and then try to eliminate the quantifiers for satisfiability. So, this says we can really eliminate which one for each y or there is x existential quantifiers, huh? because you are ending at for each y. So, existential quantifiers can be removed, can be eliminated by following this procedure. Okay? So, this procedure is called as quantifier elimination and let us write qua L. We are just eliminating the quantifiers. So, procedure is simple. What you have to do is take any occurrence of there is say the first occurrence. So, given a formula or we can write a sentence rather because we have taken existential closure of the formula given a sentence x find the first occurrence of there exists right suppose it is suppose it is there exists x it uses some variable call that variable as x let x1 to xn be the set of variables such that for each x1 for each xn occur prior to there exists x. Since it is the first one all of the others will be for all quantifiers right. So, you just take blindly all of them that is your x 1 to x n. Now, what you do delete x i from this set if both x x i do not occur in a predicate. So, it is simultaneous occurrence right do not occur you may write simultaneously. In a predicate. So, do it for each i. So, the updated set is the set of variables on which x depends right. So, what we have to do is write the updated set of variables. So, let y say i 1 y j 2 y j k in fact, we can write x also if you give subscripts x j k be the updated set. Okay. So, take a new function symbol say g of arity If there are k variables remaining, then take the k array function symbol g. Now, delete the occurrence of the rejects, replace all occurrences of x by g of x j 1 to x j k. Right. So, then this is only one step. Then next step is you take your new x as this new formula what is obtained from this. 
and continue. Is that okay? So, set x to this formula to the obtained formula, it is again a sentence continue. Okay. So, that means up to this you have eliminated the first quantifier which is existentially quantified. Then again you apply, again look for the first in the remaining sentence, then continue. So, all the existential quantifiers are eliminated now. So, this quantifier elimination is really quantifier elimination of there exists. Okay. Then at the end of it the formula you get there is no existential quantifier, only for alls are there. Fine. Now, drop the all for alls. Hence, forward we will make it a convention that whatever we get the free variables are universally quantified. Right? Remember this and just drop the quantifiers, that is how quantifier elimination is over. Now, you get only some quantifier free formula, where all the quantifiers are all the free variables are universally quantified. Suppose you start with a formula x then from there you get one sentence which is the existential closure of x. Okay. Then you are replacing the there exists. So, if there is any free variable in x all those will be replaced by new constants finally, because all those free variables will be existentially quantified in the beginning. Now, take any existential quantifier before it there is no for all. So, that will be just replaced by a constant. right? So, you can really modify quality instead of taking the existential closure in the beginning. Just replace all the free variables by new constant that should be your first step, then continue that also can be done. right? Okay. So, by this quantifier elimination after the end of this step you get no existential quantifier occurring in the formula. Okay. So, that formula is called the Skolem form of the formula and this process is called scolemization. These functions we are introducing they are called scolem functions g's or indical functions and the term you are using is called a scolem term. Right? So, there are some terminology here we will just write those terminologies. So, these g's the new functions or function symbols are called scolem functions or even indical functions. And then the g of after you get x 1 to x n and so on x j 1 to x j k are called scolem terms or sometimes indical terms. Okay. So, the sentence x s which is which has no there is now is called a sentential form it is called a sentential form of the formula x. So, we write as x capital S and then prefix of this x x once omitted. So, that is the prefix of x s are all universal quantifiers, right? because by this all existential quantifiers have gone. So, all that remains quantifiers in the beginning are the for alls in x s. So, the prefix are only universal quantifiers, once you omit the prefix. So, that is the matrix of x s. Right? So, there is also a terminology for this x small s which is matrix of x x is called the scolem form okay. scolem form 
then a C n f equivalent of this coulomb form is called a coulomb C n f or S C n f. See once you get x small s the coulomb form in this coulomb form you have only the formula there is no quantifier. So, there will be implication signs by conditionals we have already eliminated at the time of rectification right at the time of converting it to print x form. So, there can be implications there can be or and and negations. So, use the propositional laws to convert it to a CNF. So, the resulting formula is called SCNF. If it is converted to a DNF, so we call it an SDNF. So, let us give a notation this XCNF will write as say X bar and this XDNF will write as X tilde. We will take an example slowly, huh? but first see how that is go. So, we have x, then we take the exponential closure, then apply quantifier elimination to get xs, then drop all for alls to get x small s, then convert it to cnf to get x bar, which is scnf, convert same xs to dnf, call it x tilde which is the SDNF right is that clear. See all these we have got by preserving satisfiability. Okay. So, what this says is x is satisfiable if and only if its existential closure is satisfiable, if and only if x capital S is satisfiable and right? quantifier elimination, if and only if forgetting the for alls that is also satisfiable is that right if and only if x bar is satisfiable if and only if x tilde is satisfiable throughout only satisfiability is preserved. The same way we can preserve also validity right, but how to preserve validity it is a dual concept it is not difficult we can check from this easily. you can also get the procedure. So, suppose we want to say that x is valid, how to preserve validity that is our question. So, x is valid this we may say this happens if and only if not x is unsatisfiable. Okay. Now, not x is unsatisfiable if and only if not x capital S subscript is unsatisfiable. Okay. So, this capital S subscript says that you first take not x existentially generalize over the free variables and then apply scolarization what you get is x capital S. Right? But all those things you are doing with not x now not with x fine. So, if this happens if not x s is unsatisfiable. Now, look at not x s how will it look in not x s for that matter take any formula y and subscript capital S that will be for alls and then some formula right. So, in not x s also you will get similar way it will be something like for all some variables are used and then some formula it will look something like this right is that okay? Now, this is unsatisfiable if and only if not of this is valid. So, we go back ok. 
Okay. Now, how does this look? We have not. Then, for all, some formula y. It looks like this. Okay. Now, once it looks like this, you take the negation inside. That will look there is x, xm, not y. Okay. So this y has been obtained from not x by scolarization. Now here what happens? Not y should be obtained from where? From y by scolarization. Is that okay? You can use double negation there. So from y, if you apply scolarization, you should reach at this place. But there is some catch. In the scolarization, after you finish, you end with for all. Here you are ending with there is. So that means you have to switch there is and for all in this collimation process. Is that clear? So you can simply modify your quality. What do you do is look at the first occurrence of for all, right? Then let these one be the variables prior to for all x used by there exists x, right? All existential quantifiers. Then continue this collimation process. So, just treat there exists as for all, for all as there exists in this collimation process. Then you reach at the same place, right, which will preserve validity. That is what this says. Is that clear? So, let us call that procedure as qua le for all. We are not doing for there exists, that is for all quantifier elimination. So, once you do that, what you finally get at is let us call it x v. So, which has no for all in it. It looks like there exists, there exists and so on and then some quantifier free formula. Okay. That is its validity form. So, we will call it the validity form of x. Next, we will introduce x f. So, in x f, we just take the matrix of x p, just like the earlier. So, this is called the functional form of x. So, just some different names. Sometimes it is called also scolem for all terms or scolem validity form and that is called scolem satisfiability form. So, here when you forget the quantifiers or you get some free variables, they are all existentially quantified in x f. Right? In x subscript small s, all free variables are universally quantified. In x f, all free variables are existentially quantified. Right? Just the dual thing is happening. Then we write a CNF, CNF of XF. We will give a notation again. Let us call it say X a hat. Right? Some notation we have to give. So, that is called the functional CNF, FCNF. And same way, we we'll write x prime as a DNF equivalent of XF, which is also written as FDNF. Now we can summarize what we have done for this as a result. So this conversion says as the following: Let x be a formula. Then formulas y, z, and then x s, x s, and x bar, x tilde, x v, x f, x hat, x prime can be constructed. So, that 
what happens y z are quantifier free fine to x s is equal to for all star of y Three, x v equal to there exists star of z. Okay. Next, x tilde is in C N F, and also quantifier free. Five. X tilde is in DNF and also quantifier free. Then XF uh, is. Okay, x s also we have to write x small s, which is which is really your y, right? So then we can forget this y z. We write your x s, x small s, and here we can write x f. <coughs> Okay. Then x hat is in C N F quantifier free. X prime is in D N F and quantifier free. And what happens is. X is satisfiable if and only if X S is satisfiable if and only if X capital S is satisfiable or you make it capital. This is small. If and only if X bar is satisfiable. If and only if x tilde is satisfiable, and similarly, x is valid. If and only if x v is valid. If and only if x f is valid. If and only if x hat is valid. If and only if x prime is valid. So big theorem we have proved. Huh? Okay. It takes a lot of time in writing itself. Let us see an example how it proceeds.
I just took something arbitrarily. Let us see. Now, this formula is in Prenex form, okay. the rectifier and in Prenex form. So, we will just see quantifier elimination, how it proceeds. Now, for scolarization with there exits x, let us preserve satisfiability first, then for validity also we will see. So, first we find there is x is here, right? there is no free variables, they have been already quantified. So, it is a sentence. For this there is x, there is no for all before it. So, if at all we have to substitute, we will substitute x with a constant c. Right? So, this will give us r c u not p y and q c and q y and p u implies p z and p z implies p u in the first term. When we forget this, there is x. So, there will be for each u v y there is w for each z except this all the others are in the prefix. Okay. Now, for each u for each v for each y we do not have to do anything. Again we concentrate on there is w. Okay. So, here what do we see? There is w before it occurring three for alls u v and y. So, now next we find out where w and u occurs nowhere, w v occurs nowhere, w y occurs nowhere. In fact, w does not occur at all. Right? So, does not matter, the algorithm does not find that, it tries to find whether with w something occurs or not. So, nothing of them occurs. So, w is also replaced by a constant d, right? that is noted down by the algorithm. There is no replacement, right? but that does not matter. So, no more replacements are here. Fine. Then for all the z is also there. So, that means we obtain x s equal to for all each u, for each v, for each y, for each z, the whole thing. Okay. Clear? This is your x superscript s. Then x small s will be just the matrix of this. This much. That is your x s. That is this column form. So this is what you obtained is the sentential form. We say that x is satisfiable if and only if the sentential form is satisfiable for all s and then this. Okay. Let us go for the validity form. Now, suppose you want SCNF or SDNF, you can simply convert it. Okay. Let us see that also before going to validity form. Here we have first one which is not RCU or not PY and QC and QY, this and not P u or P z and not P z or P u. Right? Then we convert it to uh, say C n f. So, distribute it not R C u or not P y and not R C u or Q c and not R C o or Q y. Other two remain as it is. Right. So, this is its S C N F. Now, see that in S C N F all the free variables are universally quantified. Right. In SDNF also, all the free variables are universally quantified. Fine. So one SDNF will be 
you can just distribute them. So you take not RCO, not RCO, not RCO, not PO, not PZ. This is one class, right? Or not RCO. All not RCO here, uh, and not PO, and PO. So that will never occur, right? It's equivalent to bottom. We forget it. Next, not RCO. Here, here, here. These two we have already taken, right? So let's take PZ. And not PZ will not come. PU will come. Okay, these two. Next, or we take with which one? See this QY. And okay, with QI. Then similarly with QC with not PI, we have to take and something else. That will be your SDNF. Now what you see, if you put this for alls, they are all universally quantified. So for all will be distributing over this and. It will be equivalent to link for all star of this, and for all star of this, and for all star of this, and so on, right? But here they will not distribute. Right? For all will not distribute over or. You cannot take it to the clauses. Some of they share the free variables, right? But in SCNF, they do not share, they can be independent. So, that is why it is natural to consider SCNF instead of SDNF because of this reason. Similarly, in FDNF, their exits will go with all the clauses, but in SCNF, their exits will not go. So, again, it is natural to consider FDNF, right. In that case, the free variables are not shared by the clauses, they are independent. Is that clear? So, we stop here.